someone asks when the tornado season is here in the US, the logical response is where and which one? The spring tornado season begins in March and April in Dixie Alley and migrates northwest to the Great Plains in late April through early June. But that's not where the storms end. Historically, Dixie Alley and points north experience a second spike in tornadic activity in November. In fact, on November 29th of this year, we saw a small tornado outbreak, mainly in Mississippi, with 40 tornado reports. It turns out that the same colliding air masses that cause tornado outbreaks in spring also occur in the month of November. The first first ingredient is a southern ridge of high pressure with warm, moist air surging north from the Gulf. This happens in the spring because temperatures across the U.S. are already warming, starting with Dixie Alley. But as you know, this change in temperature is nowhere near linear. Mid-latitude cyclones form and sweep across the entire Midwestern and Eastern U.S., and they contain strong cold fronts that knock the temperature back down. Depending on where you are in the U.S., the temperature can follow this kind of sawtooth pattern, where it warms up slowly over the course of a few days as the cyclone approaches, then the cold front causes the temperature to plummet the next day. As these cyclones approach the area where the warm, moist air is surging northward, usually over Dixie Alley in April, you get wind shear from the change in wind speed and direction with height, instability due to drier air aloft, and if there is sunshine throughout the day, lift due to the heating of the ground by the sun. But as winter approaches, cold air starts to dominate the U.S. east of the Rockies. There are far fewer periods of time where a ridge of warm air can build, and the moisture from the Gulf can't penetrate very far north. But while less frequent, it does still happen, and the results can be just as devastating. The biggest difference between April tornado outbreaks and November tornado outbreaks are the angle of the sun. If skies are clear and the sun is able to heat the ground to get that surface air to rise, there's significantly less energy being absorbed absorbed by the sun in November than in April. Let's take the city of Birmingham, Alabama, for example. On November 20th, the sun is only 36 degrees above the horizon at its highest point. This means that the maximum solar radiation that the ground receives is 495 watts per meter squared. However, on April 20th, the sun is 68 degrees above the horizon and the maximum solar radiation is 847 watts per meter squared. That's nearly double the amount of solar radiation in April as in November. But with certain November weather setups, that lack of solar radiation doesn't really matter. And this is where we have to talk about Veterans Day weekend 2002. Now, unfortunately, this current weekend in November, the weather isn't as nice. But as you guys might know, I'm a man who has optimized my life for getting work done anywhere, no matter the weather. If I can find a way to not be confined to just one office or workplace, I will get out of there and do the same work around town. I grab my tiny little laptop and my tiny little mouse and head to my favorite coffee shops. I have been using NordVPN for the past year as a security blanket when connecting to public Wi-Fi, and I'm very happy with the ease of use, the protection of my data from other devices connected to the same network, and the great internet speeds. God forbid if somebody finds out I'm downloading gigabytes of archive Nextrad level to data using public Wi-Fi. They probably wouldn't care. They might think I'm a little weird. And NordVPN is more than just a VPN. The real-time threat protection helps me identify malicious websites that I may stumble upon on the 10th page of Google search results, blocking sketchy pop-ups and websites before they even have a chance to load. Got multiple devices? No problem. One account can be used on up to six devices, which means my laptop, desktop, and stack of 2010 Dell Latitudes are all covered. Yep. No compatibility issues here. If you've been wanting to try a VPN to keep your data safe and just haven't really gotten around to it, go to nordvpn.com slash weatherbox to get the two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus four bonus months free. And of course, it's all risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. And now back to 2002. What would eventually be one of the wildest and most widespread November tornado outbreaks came after a wet and chilly start to the month. Several low pressure systems came through the Midwest and the Great Lakes, bringing strong cold fronts through the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast. Temperatures were in the 40s most of the time. 
But what happened over the next few days was downright ridiculous. Warm air from the Gulf began surging northward as it does over Dixie Alley in March and April. But it didn't stop after it hit the Kentucky state line. It surged all the way north to Michigan, pushing temperatures well into the 60s and dew points followed suit. This absolutely massive warm front, stretching east from a deepening cyclone starting to accelerate northeastward, created a vast expanse east of the Mississippi where tornadic activity was possible. Now, just because it's 60 degrees in Ohio and Indiana doesn't necessarily mean a tornado. It's 60 and sunny today, and I'll be damned if I see a tornado within the next hour. Let's look at a few more of the meteorological variables at play and see if we can narrow down where exactly this tornado outbreak is going to take place. The warmest air was located over Dixie Alley, which would also likely offer clear skies early in the day to help heat the lower atmosphere, creating intense instability. North of Kentucky, however, thick cirrus clouds would likely block a lot of the sun's radiation from hitting the ground. Tremendous wind shear was present directly east of and along the entire length of the cold front high in the atmosphere. The approaching trough was so large that anywhere east of its axis, which is right here, was very unstable. But the Storm Prediction Center doesn't really like issuing a high risk for eight states stretching a thousand miles. They did it a lot before in the 80s and 90s, but they were slowly starting to become more strict with their polygons. Furthermore, the morning cloud cover and lower temperatures in Indiana and Ohio would likely put a significant cap on exploding supercells. This area encompassing Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi, on the other hand, had most of the ingredients in place with the addition of clear morning skies in much warmer air. So at midnight on November 10th, the Storm Prediction Center issued this high risk for the area just mentioned. And spoiler alert, they both nailed it and were very wrong. The following morning, a band of light to moderate rain stretched just east of the cold front from Madison, Wisconsin to Texarkana. And at around 1 p.m. Eastern, the first storms of the day initiated in south central Illinois, quickly forming into a disorganized squall line as they moved east. These storms became severe pretty quickly, producing damaging winds and large hail. Throughout the next hour, the squall line would race east with storms initiating on both the northern and southern sides. The National Weather Service had issued a severe thunderstorm watch for northeastern Indiana, in northwestern Ohio, and at 12.35 Eastern, the Storm Prediction Center put out a mesoscale discussion, which read, While vertical shear profiles are sufficient for supercells and a possibility of isolated tornadoes, further evolution into a squall line appears likely in the next few hours, with the primary severe threat being damaging winds in 40 to 50 knot mean flow environment. Narrow line of intense thunderstorms should spread across the forecast area. Ironically enough, immediately after this discussion was posted, the storms initiating on the northeastern corner of the squall line were becoming quite concerning. These were embedded discrete supercells and were showing signs of strong rotation. Despite the likelihood that these individual storms would congeal into a squall line and lose the energy needed for lawn track violent tornadoes, they didn't do that. You see, oftentimes the discrete storms that develop ahead of a squall line are the ones of greatest concern. They exist in an undisturbed moisture rich environment and are more likely to produce a tornado. It's like being the first person of the day to swim in a public pool. You're more likely to have a nice, unpolluted swim before 60 kids jump into the water. The discrete storm east of the squall line was this one, moving northeast through Hartford City. It dropped a completely unwarned F1 tornado, which damaged a few commercial buildings on the southwest side of the city. 15 miles to the east, the same supercell, along with a second circulation to the north, dropped two stronger tornadoes near Bern and Bluffton. But these tornadoes were only on the ground for a couple miles. At this point, the Northern Indiana Weather Service saw that this thunderstorm was exhibiting strong signs of a rotation on radar and issued tornado warnings for Eastern Adams and Van Wert County across the Ohio state line. And as this supercell crossed over said state line, it produced the most infamous tornado of the entire outbreak. The tornado touched down in far northwestern Van Wert County, as noted by the velocity couplet in the bounded weak echo region, or as I call it, the donut hole in reflectivity. It's similar to the echo from the tornado that hit Coleman, Alabama on April 27, 2011. Now, this to my knowledge is one of the most filmed violent tornadoes in the history of Ohio. Robbie Frank, located a few miles to the east of the circulation on Newford Road, was in perfect position to film the tornado as it touched down. And the funnel cloud seems to be on the ground, coming on German Church Road, going north, east, from Convoy Hour. 
two more miles to the north on Glenmore Road and dangerously close to the growing tornado, John Nofer captured the small cone as it traveled to the north of his property. Right there it is, coming over the woods! Oh, God. Go get the kids. Go get the kids. Hurry up. This is a rare situation where we can see both Robbie and John's videos from different perspectives simultaneously as the tornado grew in size and intensity, heading straight for the city of Van Wert, population 10,000. It's going up. Come here, look. Real quick. Real quick. A few more miles to the northeast, the Moninger family on Ritchie Road watched the now wedge tornado pass by a mile and a half to the northwest of their property. Is it sweeping back this way or not? It looks like it could be. A mile to the north on Ritchie Road, Randy Baker may have been the closest person to the tornado who was filming at the time. I feel sorry for whoever's in the road of that. Yeah, car over there. Yeah, it's coming between them. Let's do it. Let's do it coming, Justin. Is that it? So you can hear the thunder, you hear the wind picking up. Yeah, Look at the fire. Look at the lightning down at the bottom. It must have touched. Look at it. it's moving north. Look at that baby. You getting it? Hold yes, it. I've got it all. Get in the house. Get in the house. Get back. At this point in time, 3.21 p.m., the National Weather Service put out a severe weather statement stating, these tornadoes will move towards downtown Van Wert. People should take cover now. Let's go. Oh. Go right Dear the Lord, get it up. Get it up, Lord. Get it up. Get it off the ground, Lord. And once again, we have a rare moment in time where both videos from the Moninger family and Randy Baker are in sync. Let's go. It's right through. Oh, man, it's just tearing. Look at that. It's right over which majiggies. Oh, it's blowing the power lines. Man. At this point, the tornado was only half a mile away and was destroying homes on Zook Road. Unfortunately, 75-year-old Alfred German, living in one of these homes, was killed when his house collapsed. The tornado then moved through fields across Highway 224, leaving cycloidal ground scours in the dirt. In Van Wert, Stephen Wasserman was driving along Lesson Avenue, adjacent to the Van Wert Regional Airport, as the tornado was approaching to the west. It's huge. Engine 3, we're back on fire band, just reporting. We have a visual on this funnel cloud. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Uh, Rear 5, I have a tornado on the ground, Liberty Union and 224, headed right toward Riley Park. Now, the city of Van Wert was actually very well prepared to handle a tornado warning. The county EMA, led by Director Rick McCoy, had implemented the use of the Federal Signal Informer, a radio receiver that broadcast an emergency tone followed by a message from emergency management. And Rick was able to then tell Scott Schaefer, manager of the Twin Cinemas on the western side of town, that a large tornado was heading directly for the theater. 60 moviegoers, mainly children, were watching Santa Claus 2 at the time and were escorted into the main hallways and bathrooms as the tornado ripped through the cinema. Cars once in the parking lot were launched into the theater seats as the front half of the building was blown away. Miraculously, everyone survived with very minor injuries. Half a mile to the northeast, the Vision Industrial Park, including National Door and Trim and Team Wholesale, was destroyed. As the tornado exited Van Wert, it had reached its mature stage and peaked in size and intensity, now an F4 wedge. On Union Pleasant Road, the Mindering family was putting the finishing touches on their new home when the tornado wiped it clean off its foundation. They were featured on Storm Stories in the mid-2000s. Link is in the description if you want to hear their full story. A state highway patrol officer was sitting in his car at the corner of Convoy and Dutch John Roads as the monster tornado passed a half a mile to his east. This moment is exactly when the Mindering's home was destroyed. This footage is unfortunately not included in the Storm Stories episode, and I think it's important because it shows just how massive and ambiguous this tornado was at the time. Juan Mindrink stated himself that he was staring at the tornado and it just looked like a giant cloud, so he didn't know if it was actually a tornado or not. This next footage, taken a few more miles to the northeast by Dave Osting on Wetzel Road, further shows how large the tornado was. A high-tension transmission tower was crumpled to the ground as the tornado continued northeast through the small community of Roselms in Paulding County, which was completely destroyed. As the squall line finally caught up to the lone Van Wert supercell, the tornado lifted after 52 miles of destruction, causing four deaths and dozens of injuries. Around 200 homes were damaged by the tornado. 
So at this point, the National Weather Service was paying close attention to this cluster of supercells in Northwest Ohio as new cells were developing just to the east. But 500 miles to the south in central Tennessee, discrete supercells were also firing 200 miles east of the Squaw Line in a moisture-rich and unstable environment. They would not produce any tornadoes for the next hour, but the National Weather Service as a whole basically put everywhere east of the Squaw Line under a tornado watch, and that proved to be the right move. At around 5 p.m., two consecutive F2 and F1 tornadoes moved through and east of Fostoria, destroying several businesses, gas stations, rail cars, and the high school. 15 minutes later, the supercell to the east produced an F3 tornado that moved through the larger city of Tiffin. Affecting the south side of town, it destroyed several homes along Nantucket and Siesta Drive. This picture taken by Alan Detrich two and a half miles away on Nelson Street may be the only photograph to exist of the tornado. It continued for 21 miles at F3 intensity, killing another person near Republic. Throughout the next several hours, the Ohio supercells produced 10 more tornadoes of F1 and F2 intensity. The most notable of the bunch is likely the F3 tornado that hit the east side of Port Clinton, barreling through several blocks of well-built homes and pushing multiple condominiums into Lake Erie. At this point in time, two things happened. One, the supercells in East Central Tennessee were dropping multiple tornadoes, most of them weak and short-lived, but got more intense as they moved further east. And the second thing is that from what I can find, the Storm Prediction Center had extended the high-risk polygon at around 8 p.m. to encompass the entire area to the east of the cold front where discrete supercells currently existed. Now, this outbreak was already much larger than the Weather Service had previously expected, and this move would help keep people much more weather aware as we got into the evening hours. Back in Tennessee, two deaths resulted from an F2 destroying a mobile home park near New Union. Half an hour later, an F3 hit the communities of Mossy Grove and Joyner, leveling 24 houses and 12 mobile homes, killing seven. While this was happening, the third and final line of supercells was moving through central Mississippi in northern Alabama, and James Spann was keeping a close eye on several of the northern supercells with intensifying circulations, one of which was barreling towards the community of Carbon Hill just west of Carbon Hill out toward the community of Kansas and Eldridge, and this is going to be moving towards the east-northeast. It's going to be crossing out of Walker County into Winston County. And then an hour later, another supercell took a nearly identical path and dropped another F3 that went through Carbon Hill again, this time hitting the southeast side of town as well as Saragossa. Dozens of buildings, including the Carbon Hill Elementary School, were destroyed. Just a few months earlier, the separate Carbon Hill High School was completely destroyed by a fire, and now there were no schools remaining. The tornadoes caused 10 deaths in Carbon Hill alone. The second tornado was on the ground for 72 miles, making it the longest tornado track of the entire outbreak. Back in Tennessee, the supercells were beginning to congeal into a squall line. At 10.34 p.m. Eastern, this cell dropped an F3 tornado south of Crossville near the Lake Tansy neighborhood. It destroyed 30 homes and killed four. As the storms continued to congeal into one singular cross-continental squall line, the threat for violent tornadoes dwindled into the night, and the outbreak was over. 83 tornadoes hit 16 states over the course of 36 hours, the strongest and most notable being the Van Wert F4. 36 people were killed. During the service assessment, which is like an internal investigation into the accuracy and efficiency of the National Weather Service during an outbreak, it was found that the lead forecaster, who is like the top in the chain of command for issuing tornado watches, was one of the most inexperienced leads on the entire team and didn't have any experience working as a lead during a tornado outbreak. Now, they didn't do a bad job, and they were lucky in the sense that Van Wert was likely one of the most prepared towns in the state of Ohio for a tornado warning. So despite the lack of a tornado watch in northwestern Ohio, the death toll was very low. This tornado outbreak was one of my personal obsessions growing up. To have a weather setup where you have wind shear and instability that widespread in the middle of November is just very rare, and to have a lawn track violent tornado on the northern side of that is even more odd. But the two takeaways from this are tornado outbreaks can occur at any time of year whenever conditions are favorable, and the city of Van Wert did everything right that day and Rick McCoy likely saved many lives. If you guys like this video, if you guys like learning about severe weather outbreaks in general, definitely subscribe, like, and comment. 
Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this episode. If you guys want to help me out, check out that link in the comments below. And over the next few months, I'll be covering some more significant winter events, if that's something you're into. See you guys soon.